This Week in Motor Week, Howard Stapleford describes the delights of the new Daihatsu Syrian, while Chris Goffey catches a marlin, and Mike Rutherford investigates the world of assertive motoring. This Week in Motor Week. Want to save the environment? Get on your bike. Here in Amsterdam it makes perfect sense and it's very pleasant too. But we all know that Holland is flat. Most of us have our ups and downs to cope with every day and in any case we're just not ready to junk the family jalopy. But with governments ever more ready to tax for poor emissions with shouts of knock your socks off, socks as in sulphur emissions you understand, car manufacturers are racing to create a new kind of car tuned to help us breathe more easily. And this is the very latest, the quirkily attractive Daihatsu Sirion. Now the people at Daihatsu have been very busy because this is the fifth new model to be released in just 14 months. And I have to say it's a darn sight more attractive than the ludicrously named Popemobile lookalike, the Daihatsu Move. There are two models, the Sirion Plus and the Sirion. This is the Plus model, top of the range. Both models have a one litre engine and Daihatsu say that it's not only amongst the most fuel efficient, it's also amongst the cleanest. But surely all this swampy-esque environmentalism isn't going to have people clamouring to the showrooms with their deposits. No, say Daihatsu, it's not just clean and green, it's also a mean machine. Let's find out. So off we go. 0 to 60 in, how long have you got? Just over 15 seconds. That's certainly a bit mean but it has a top speed of about 90 miles an hour and what's impressive to me is that a one litre engine can sometimes scream at those top speeds but the ride quality is extremely good and at the top end, the top speeds, it's remarkably quiet for a small car. Very good indeed. This version has the five-speed manual gearbox with a link rod system which means that changing between gears is extremely crisp. Also, automatic transmission is available on both of these models. Well, let's have a look at what's happening underneath the bonnet. The new three-cylinder engine is the heart of the Syrian. It uses twin camshafts and four valves per cylinder and ranks as one of the world's most efficient petrol engines. The camshafts are driven by scissors gears and the engine revs very smoothly, produces good torque. A catalyzer also lowers CO, HC and NOx emissions. Even with a 54 brake horsepower engine, the result is one of the lowest fuel consumption figures of any passenger car, at 51 miles per gallon for the manual version and 44 miles per gallon for the automatic. It's the best in its class. Meanwhile, let's take another look at the shape, which I like a lot. The shoulders are flared out, which makes it look wider than it actually is. And the Plus version has a rear spoiler, which you can bet has no practical use whatsoever in a car of this size, but looks rather fetching. And Chrome is back in a rather sleek way, on the bumpers and along the side. Nice big bug eyes at the front as well. Boot space, a respectable 235 litres value for money. The basic Syrian comes in at just under £8,000, the Syrian Plus fully loaded £9,500, which is actually cheaper than say the Vauxhall Corsa or the Nissan Micra, and there are some elegant specs. For instance, driver and passenger airbags as standard, side airbags down here for the Syrian Plus, side impact bars too, power assisted steering, and also electrically controlled front and back windows here on the Sirion Plus, an engine immobiliser, and here's a nice little American touch down here, cup holders for all those fizzy drinks. But here is the car's best trick. How about this? Fold flat door mirrors. Very neat. It also has a pretty decent stereo system with four speakers in the plus and two speakers in the basic model. Tamelijk gepeperde uitspraken over de de rol van de Joden en brachten dat op een ongelukkige wijze denk ik in verband met het lijden van de Joden. Couldn't agree more. Whether it was the styling or the colour, this little Sirion did turn a few Dutch heads out on the road. Except for the guy who really fancied himself in his 1982 Daihatsu Quare. Now they don't make him like that anymore.
Now, I have to admit, I'm a classic car enthusiast. My car is a 1947 Citroën Traction, and much as I love it, I'd be the first to admit it's hardly practical everyday transport. It boils in traffic, it's got heavy steering, and it's very difficult to park in city conditions. So how would it be if you had a classic looking car equipped with modern running gear that kept up with everyday traffic and also satisfied current safety and emission laws? Not a new idea of course in the sports car field, well Morgan has been doing that for years, Panther tried it with the Kalista and Caterham are still very successful with the brilliant old 7. And here's another variation on the theme from a company called Marlin. Marlin's history goes back to the late 70s as suppliers of upmarket kit cars. But today they want to be regarded as manufacturers of brand new turnkey sports cars. So how does something like this compare to competition like the MGF or Mazda's MX-5? Well, in the first place, although it looks like a traditional sports car body mounted on a separate chassis, in fact, this is a, a semi-monocoque design. It's a proper passenger safety cell with crushable front and crushable rear end. And under the bonnet, well, there's a surprise. Powering this Marlin Sportster is a 2.8 litre straight six BMW developing around 190 brake horsepower and mated to a BMW 5 speed gearbox. In a car of this size and weight, that obviously means serious performance. Traditional bonnet locks, but uh, very modern looking suspension, double wishbone and Ford hubs and components, and in here, huge ventilated four-pot caliper Ford disc brakes. At the back, Ford independent rear suspension with a chassis-mounted differential, and again, ventilated disc brakes. So much for the technical side, how does it go? As you'd expect from the fat wheels shod with ultra sticky Toyo tyres, ultimate road holding is very high, but it's the ride that impresses. Smooth, relatively soft, none of the crashing from pothole to pothole you get in a, a Morgan, for instance. Steering is light and precise, and since you can watch the front wheel through a corner, you can place it to an inch. The power delivery is typically BMW, smooth power right up to the red line, and lots of torque for relaxed cruising. You do get blown around a lot with the aero screens, but the car comes with a windscreen and hood if you so desire. The Marlin's very well built, it's a strong chassis and there's a pleasing absence of shakes and rattles. With the BMW engine, this one retails for a shade over £23,000, which is a lot of money when you consider what an MGF or an MX-5 costs. With the Ford four-cylinder 2.3-litre engine, well, it comes in at under 20000 and that makes a lot more sense. Against that, you get a car that can be tailor-built to exactly your own specification. You certainly won't uh, see another one on the high street next to you. And if you're into weekend motorsport, well, this is the car for you. After the break on Motor Week, Mike Rutherford discovers what to do when you hit a spot of bother on the roads.
Well, I've been punted up the rear in my Volvo. I've been uh, knocked off the road, or almost. But what happens when you actually come across a roadblock? You've got nowhere to go behind you, you've got nowhere to go to the side, and you've got a couple of cars parked in front of you. Well, I've got my protective gear. Don't try this one at home. The gloves to protect me from broken glass. This thing to protect me, my neck. The overalls, of course. And what we're gonna do, well, let's just show you. So I'm just going up, deciding which side I'm gonna hit. I think I'll take this side. <laughs> So Chris, tell us what Drive Tech's about and what it tries to achieve in conjunction with Citroen. We're trying to raise the standard of all the drivers who come to us. We're not here to retrain people. Mm. What we're trying to do is have a look at their skills and add to those rather than radically try and change them. After all, we generally have people with us for only half a day or even a full day. Mm. It's as much what you can do for them up here as it is with their, their hands and their feet, isn't it? It's, it's a lot about attitude. Yeah, certainly. Over 80% of what we're trying to achieve is attitude-based. Mm. I believe we can all drive reasonably well if we're concentrating fully on it. Mm. Um, just remember your driving test. I mean, you know, it's sweating for half an hour. Mm. It seemed like an eternity. Mm. Whereas what most people are doing is driving along on autopilot mm. with all the pressures of the 90s mm. and the amount of traffic out there um, reacting to actual danger rather than looking ahead, planning and anticipating mm. through the potential dangers that could be out there. Mm. And what are the dangers? What, what are the mistakes that people make? What do people underestimate when they're out on the road? I think a lot of people have an overinflated opinion of their own driving mm. skills in the first place. Mm. Um, what they don't necessarily appreciate is what the lack of skills and appreciation and danger around them just by driving up and down the road. There could be somebody behind them on the mobile phone mm. with a desk diary on their lap, mm. concentrating, stressed out, not concentrating at all on driving. Uh, if they're not aware of that driver behind, then how can they possibly uh, change their driving styles to accommodate them? Yeah, I, that was one of the things I found intriguing when I was out on the on the, one of the public roads with one of your guys. Not only are you looking ahead, not, not only are you looking side to side, but you're very, very aware of what's behind you. For example, coming up to a traffic light, so you don't just stop at that red light, do your bit, stick within the law. You make sure that uh, there's nobody about to ram you from behind, and you make yeah. sure you've got an escape route just in case there is. That's right. I mean, in my previous life as a traffic policeman, and don't worry, I have had the operation, and hopefully back to normal again now, <laughs> but in my previous life, you'd have people in hospital two broken legs swearing it wasn't their fault you know mm. I stopped in time it was that mm. prep behind me mm. now that guy's probably going to have arthritis in later years he's mm. going to be a sad miserable bugger mm. for the rest of his life yeah. saying it wasn't his fault mm. well how many times is an accident 100% one party's fault mm. there's generally a contributing factor from both sides mm. and what we're trying to show people is you don't have to get involved in an accident in the first place that's mm. more important than working out well it wasn't my fault mm. it's 10 to 7 in the morning the visibility is 2 to 3 lane lines patchy fog. The police fire an ambulance on the way to the scene of this accident were actually being overtaken by general members of the public. You can see the marker board, the one mile marker board at the top of the picture and you can use that as a reference point. So initially we have the yellow van comes to a halt against the central reservation for no apparent reason. At the inquest he said that a pigeon or a bird had flown up in front of his screen and he'd swerved to avoid it. But somebody actually pointed out that birds don't fly in fog. So it's possibly thought that the guy fell asleep or a lack of concentration caused him to collide. Anyway, as you can see, initially, the first two cars managed to avoid him. And already there's vehicles actually taking the hard shoulder. But the first impact comes from the red vehicle. 
So he's, the uh, silver car moved away, leaving him unsighted. And that's the first impact. The second yellow vehicle coming into view has four builders on their way to work. In the back of that vehicle are some butane gas cylinders. At one of the later impacts, those gas cylinders exploded, causing the fire. Now you can see the red car on the hard shoulder. Possibly that's not such a good idea to stop. He's right in the, um, the heat of the accident. He should have moved on and uh, stopped the next SOS phone one or two miles up the road to phone for assistance. So already we can see two lanes of the motorway blocked, only lane one and a small section of the hard shoulder is actually open for an escape route. And the majority of the traffic up to now has been in lane two and lane three, middle and the right hand lane. The following distances have been totally inadequate, one to two lane lengths. So at the moment we've got vehicles travelling too fast and too close. Now the whole motorway now is blocked bar the hard shoulder. So if we look now at the, the car in the middle of the picture, it's a brilliant bit of driving, maybe has ABS, I don't know, but he goes across lane one, across the hard shoulder. This guy is brilliant, he goes across the bank, round the top of the car that we mentioned before, and he's home and dry. What a brilliant bit of driving, but he makes a fatal error. He stops and look what's coming up behind him. 38 tonnes doing 56 miles an hour, and that mistake cost this guy his life. If you look in lane one, we're going to have a, an articulated vehicle under braking jackknifes. Using the mile board as a reference point, look how far it sweeps the traffic down the road. It's just like matchwood. So what we have now is a raging inferno. We've got a, a red car in lane three. Does he get out? Does he stay in the vehicle? I mean, invariably, he's going to be collected by another vehicle. The car and trailer in lane one is an army vehicle with a trailer. And that jackknife's under braking. Look at the following distances. Just too close. The artic articulated vehicle in lane one has left some sort of gap. But what happens is the vehicles in lane two under braking dive into his braking area, decreasing his braking uh, distance and gap. So what he does is he comes across into lane two and basically is just looking for someone to hit. And when he does hit the traffic, he rides up over the top and you wouldn't want to be underneath that. The car in lane three has just been collected by another red car as the Arctic goes over the top. Coming into the top of the pitch now, you've got two vehicles travelling so fast and so close together. Apparently they're from the same company and they didn't want to be separated. So when the first vehicle impacts, the front goes down, the back lifts up, and the second guy goes in underneath, and that costs him his life. The Joe average person generally comes to us when they've just wrapped up mum and dad's car at 18 years of age, and mum and dad say, hey, we've got a problem here, you nearly died, we're now going to pay for you to have driver training. Um, What's happening now with the government in this country is they're encouraging driver training companies like DriveTech to do training courses for people that may have had an accident, may have um, had enough to be prosecuted, and they're saying, no, have driver training rather than go to court and be prosecuted. Mm. They're trying to find a remedy to the situation. Mm. What we're now saying is don't wait to have the accident. Come to us first. Mm. Have you seen the price now of scratching metallic paintwork in this mm. country? Mm. Uh, that's paid for a course. Yeah. Just that one problem. ABS training, you told me you're an expert at ABS, so uh, let's go out on the skid pan and find out at 60 mile an hour what you can really do. Yeah, I reckon I'm pretty good at uh, reacting to obstacles in the road. Yeah, you told me that about ABS as well just now, if you remember. Um, but let's see how really good you are. Let's go out and have a few cones chucked out in front of you at high speed and just see what your car control skills are really like. Well, our courses start from £60, and that's for a half-day course. Mm. We can do skid training, we can do road training, but we try and customise the course mm. to make sure each individual gets what they want. Mm. If you've got somebody who keeps reversing into shopping trolleys, then you need to gear the course a bit differently. Mm. If you've got somebody who keeps getting nicked for speeding, then you've got to address different, different attitude problems there. Mm. Uh, it's basically whatever you want, we can, we can supply it within reason.
Still celebrating the launch of the Syrian, Daihatsu have announced that if you buy one of these new hatches before the 31st of July, you can order the optional automatic gearbox for free. And after this offer closes, the automatic option will go back to its 795 list price. Deyu, who enjoyed spectacular success when they launched the mark in the UK, are hoping for similar results stateside. They're shipping cars prior to launching the brand new versions on the US market. The Korean company hoped to find 35,000 American buyers by the end of this year. Ford recently celebrated their 95th birthday. Founder Henry Ford introduced the moving production line to the car industry, doing more than most pioneers to bring motoring to the average man. A tradition continues with the current range. Let's remind ourselves of some Ford classics. We'll see you next week on Motor Week.